Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archived classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Live from the Bhakti Center in New York City, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host, Raghunath, and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York, Astuba Das. Welcome to the show, welcome to the Bhakti Center, and welcome to the Wisdom of the Sages retreat here live at the Bhakti Center. Everybody make some noise. I should have posted like a game show. I'm serious, like Wheel of Fortune. I think that's my calling. That, that would have been my dharma. Spin the wheel. Anyway, welcome everybody. So this is our daily study of the Srimad Bhagavatam. This week's a little special. We're, it's our, we're in New York City with all of the people that I feel like are my family members. Jeffrey Ackler's here. Ariel's here. Right? Kelly Becker's here. These people I see every day in this weird um, dystopian futuristic thing where your closest people are living on a screen. It's quite strange. And now they're here face to face. And Kostuba, who I always see every day on a screen, is now here face to face. I've actually never met Kostuba. <laughs> First time we've ever met. <laughs> Mara is sitting by my side. She flew down here this morning and uh, flew. And I say flew, I meant sped on her car and broke the speed limit. But we're all here in person. And I'm so happy. I met a bunch of others this morning during the yoga class. And we're going to have a whole day of hearing Hari Kata. We heard that we read this great verse the other day, Kostuba, about how the desire to hear material subject matters is the cause for our repeated birth and death in samsara. Where did you hear that? Canto. The desire to hear mundane subject matters is our cause for bondage in the material world. So when we hear transcendental truth literature, wisdom literature, it's like the access point out of this cycle of birth and death. What do you think about that? I'm not going to I'm not going <laughs> to argue gonna with oppose the Bhagavatam. The Bhagavatam. <laughs> but it makes a lot of sense to me, sure. The more that we whatever we hear, you know, deeply affects our mind. Mm. And so we got to choose real carefully what we're going to listen to. I was I was using this analogy before. If I say uh, I'm going to go to the gym, how much do you think I will change? I'm not going to change at all. But if I say, I'm going to go to the gym four days a week for an hour and a half a day with a trainer, then automatically in one month you'll see a, a difference. So there's a difference between an explicit choice and an implicit choice. Explicit has some parameters. And the whole yoga, bhakti, spiritual sadhana is an explicit choice to make a distinct change in your day-to-day -day life. And it's really our day-to-day -day life that makes up the quality of our life. It's what I'm doing day-to-day -day on a regular basis when things are tough, when things are easy, when I got lots of stuff going on, when I got nothing going on. I had a lot going on yesterday. I, I, I understand you know, that, yeah. Rumors? You saw the face, the Instagram photo. We were about to go to leave, you know, packing up kids. That's always a thing, packing up kids. I had a whole bunch of stuff to do in the morning. We had, you know, we did our show in the morning and then I had to get all the kids out of the house by two o'clock. The 11th hour, the seven-year-old breaks his leg. Oh. Two places broke his leg. So we had to go to the hospital and do all that. 
Um, but I had to keep that. Right. My point is, thanks for everybody who sent the prayers. But my point is that I still have to have my regular spiritual stuff happening. I have to hear. I have to chant. I have to, you know, I have to keep focused. And if you do that on a regular basis, it can protect you from the riptide of Maya. The riptide of Maya drags us out to this ocean of birth and death, isn't it? When I say birth and death, that sounds almost poetic, even though it's real. But be, if, if, if it's too much to digest the ocean of birth and death, think about the circular loops we make in our life on a regular basis, the same silly mistakes we make again and again that go on uh, auto-renew. Well, that's a good one, auto-renew. Auto-renew again and again. And so um, this hearing transcendental sound is the protection from that. I just want to let Mary know, I, I, uh, Nitchin under China saying we're showing like all the, the little squares instead of like the speaker. Yeah, oh. Oh, I put it on square view. Yeah, it's on speaker. It's got to be on speaker view. For Facebook Live. Oh. There you go. Sorry about that. I like to see all the faces. The, yeah, I got to look at these faces now. Yeah, they're all here. I'm scared of people <laughs> live. <laughs> Jen Hunt is here, another Zoomer. So these are famous people. They're famous in my world and maybe famous to you. <laughs> they're all here. People flew in from different places, from Oregon. We have a bunch of people here from Nepal. Kathy Haggard is here. We got Madhu here from Sri Lanka. <laughs> different, different Madhu than our other Madhu. So today is Q&A day. So if you're new to this, this is an, uh, a day that we take questions because part of just hearing transcendental truth is questioning it. This is why I always found Mara suspicious. Because <laughs> Mara would go, when, when this whole thing started, Mara and Garunga Avatar, they used to come to Super Soul Farm and we used to, I used to give class to them on a regular basis. And so me and Garunga Avatar, we'd go back and forth, we'd ask questions, and Mara would just be like this. I understand. I understand. I understand. And she'd never ask a question. I was wondering if she's absorbing this stuff. I think she is. I think oh, she, is she has the wonderful. answers inside. Okay. We've got a delay on my skull here. Isn't that weird? I'm seeing a delay in me moving. Okay, so let's start this with the sacred mantras we can all say together in this room. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Kostuba, let's see if they know this one. Narayanam Namaskritya Naramchaiva Narotamam Devim Saraswatim Vyasam Tatojayam Mudiraye. Before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is our very means of conquest, one should offer respectful obeisances to the Supreme Lord Narayan. Unto Narayan Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being, unto Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and to Srila Vyasadev, the author. Nasta Prayesha Bhagreshu Nityam Bhagavat Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naistiki. By regular attendance and classes in the Bhagavatam and by rendering service to the pure. Devotees. All that is, All that is troublesome <laughs> to the heart will become eradicated. As long with, with, with a lot of your memory. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, was thinking, I, was, I, I was thinking about something. Uh, and loving service to the Supreme Lord who is praised with transcendental songs will be established as an irrevocable fact. Om Jnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Nena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. I was born in the darkness of ignorance. My teachers are opening my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. I offer my respectful obeisances at their lotus feet. Right. You know what I was thinking about? That we don't normally do that when we have questions and answers? Yes. <laughs> yes, we don't usually do that prayer. Uh, by, by rendering service to the pure devotee. Well, how do you do that? We are going to be pulling Lord Jagannath's cart uh -huh. down Fifth Avenue. Mm -hmm. Right. That is a service to all the great saints and acharyas who went before us. And then another thing I was thinking about when it says um, who is pra the, uh, who's praised with transcendental songs. That's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be singing and chanting in front of the cart. It's all coming. To it's come all <laughs> manifesting today. It's quite exciting. OK, what's up with our questions, Mara? Where's our let's get this show on the road. 
You got him pulled up? I can't read that. I think I Justin, can't. your assistant, pulled him up for you. Justin, the, my assistant, pulled them up, but he left everything else open. Justin. Just kidding, Justin. Justin is the new... You know, it's sort of like you volunteer that for that when you become a brahmachari. You, you volunteer to get corrected, and we yeah. got it. Yeah, do all the grunt stuff. Oh, not, not that just the grunt <laughs> stuff, but you gotta get you gotta get a little disciplined. <laughs> I'm always disciplined, Justin. Look at him over there. He's exhausted from my disciplining. He's just like, <laughs> okay. This is from Jefferson and Karen Francis from Miami. All right. All right. Why did our God, who loves us, make creatures that hurt us? Like mosquitoes and snakes. Maybe he doesn't love us all that much after all. <laughs> He's never got on to YouTube late at night. There's a lot more worse things out there than mosquitoes and snakes. Yeah. So, you know, this question, um, it, it, you know, it kind of ties in with the classic question of why is there evil in the world? or Why do bad things happen why? to good people? Yeah. And so it's just a kind of another way of phrasing that, I suppose you could say. But, you know, there's an assumption behind the question. And it's that assumption that we have to look at. Is this world meant to be set up so that we have nothing but nice, pleasurable experiences? Like, is that what this world was made for? Life's a party. Yeah, I mean, if we, we you know, I guess the, the idea is, well, the person that's controlling it all cares about us, apparently. So why would that person allow us to suffer but i mean i guess you're a parent and you care about your kids and you kind of you will allow them to enter into circumstances where they might experience some kind of like you don't kind of build like barriers so that they can have nothing but pleasurable experiences right like as a parent that's not your job it, it creates a dysfunctional child if they have no type of challenges in their life they need to experience. We, I mean, this is a huge yeah. thing with that book, The Coddling, The American Mind. You know, oh, The Coddling, we, The American we, we Mind. We coddle <laughs> so much now, you know, because in our days, we were 14 years old hanging out on First Avenue. I was. Although we, my parents didn't know about it. You know, well, we were on Avenue B. We were Avenue B. I parked on Avenue B. Um, and I said to my kids, I was like, we were so scared on this road when we were growing up. Like, to go on Avenue B back in the day, we had to have a whole posse of people with us. You remember that? It was like scary to go to Avenue B or Avenue C. And now, nowadays, it's not so bad. But we did that when we were 14 and 15 years old. Like, what were our parents thinking? And now we're protective, but to the point of overly protective. And the kids have no sort of like learn. Uh, they have no sort of. Yes. What is it? What don't they have? You know what? We've become domesticated beasts, <laughs> right? We've come to, this is the same old thing. We've just sort of like been neutered. We've got our nails clipped and we just can't, we, we can't figure out how to deal with the world. And therefore you, you set up your children, not be able to um, have any success in the world. You got to figure stuff out. Well, then figure out, okay, this guy's dangerous. Don't hang out with dangerous people. This guy's good. And it, you want to protect, but at a certain point, you, it's like the Buddha. Right. They kept him in a sheltered situation his entire life because they didn't want him to see disease or death. Right. I've heard that. You've heard this story. And yeah. then they let him out in the world. And he's like, oh, my God, people are dying. Oh, my God. People are sick. Oh, right. my God. P -p -p people are in pain. And here's the point Good. that that led to his enlightenment. Right. Uh -huh. So and, and, and so that's what this, this world isn't meant to be set up so that we have nothing but pleasurable experience. That's not its purpose. Pleasure and safety. Yeah. The, the purpose is that we can develop our enlightenment through it. And if it was only pleasure, we wouldn't do that. So sometimes parents have to create a circumstance where the, the child experiences some suffering or create a create a like a. Um, will set up the plan so that if they stray in the wrong direction, that there's some pain that you feel, there's some discomfort that you feel. And in so therefore there are snakes, therefore there are mosquitoes, therefore there's suffering in this world, is that this isn't actually meant to be our home. We, we're choosing to enter into illusion to kind of like play a role that we're not really meant to play. And so suffering, it, or you could say karma, right? Karma is programmed into the world so that when we're acting in a way that's kind of like leading us back in the right direction, we're getting rewards. 
And when we're moving in a direction which really has to do with selfishness, essentially, most essentially, right? Our nature is to serve with love. So our, our nature is selfless. When we start to act selfish, then there's pain there. And that pain may come in the form of a mosquito, it may come in the form of a snake, it may come in the form of you know, so many different uh, types of suffering. So that's why suffering is in this world. This, we, we should take it for granted that I'm gonna suffer in this world. Right? Even as I learn the lessons that th this world is designed to provide not only pleasure but also pain. But if we can uncover our true nature, then we can kind of enter into that spiritual realm where we can live in harmony with, with that. And, and snakes and mosquitoes and all that won't be necessary anymore. We've become so damn intolerant, haven't we? Yeah. Intolerant. Even in, you know, when I first went to Europe, traveling through Europe, um, compared to America, in America, we wash our clothes. Then we dry our clothes. And I remember going through Europe and nobody had dryers. I was like, well, we just hang them outside. I was like, what? <laughs> gonna hang your, <laughs> it was like so like, I was like, it's gonna take hours. <laughs> and they're like, no, you just hang them up. You gotta put them up on the clothesline. They, you know what they had? They had spinners. They, was, they spin them, right? Any Europeans here, you know the steel. They just spin them and then you hang them up. That drove me insane. <laughs> That's what we do. I hang my clothes. You have a spinner? I don't have, well, the, the washing machine has a spinner. The then, washing machine is a spinner. Yeah. Anyway, I can get onto European washing machines just <laughs> for hours on that one. But anyway, we'd become intolerant. Yeah. And you realize that when you're traveling through the, a third world country or a developing country, and you're just like, what? Why can't and, they just figure it so out? So, in other words, we're trying to coddle ourselves at every. We've coddled moment. ourselves yeah. at every. We've made everything so incredibly safe. Yeah. Huh? And it's not good for, for enlightenment. We were talking about Madhu and the Sri Lanka. There's this pilgrimage through Sri Lanka where you're going through. We were talking this morning. And you go for like months or something, Madhu. And you go for months. And then what happens is, yeah, you go right through the jungle barefoot. It's like really intense on the elements. And there, you're going through the jungle and there's leopards. And sometimes you lose a person. Yeah, occasionally you lose a person. Part of the, <laughs> you know, sometimes you get lost with a leopard. You lose a person on pilgrimage. Fuck, you know, it's the game Comes, of life. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Great pilgrimage. We only lost two. And hopefully we won't lose anyone at the Rathiatra today, but it does happen. It does happen. Get caught under those wheels. <laughs> Careful around the wheels. For real. Yeah, yeah for real. Yeah. We, for real. For wheel. <laughs> careful around the I mean it's a gigantic wooden cart that has no brakes. Be careful around it. <laughs> All, right, All right, you ready? I got a question for you. What you got? Oh. Look who it's from. It's from Matt Godden, who's Matt with us Godden, here today. Matt Godden, who's here personally today in his personal form. <laughs> so here we go. This question is, I have a question for Q&A Day. My question is, what is, it, what is it okay to pray to Krishna for? Every day I pray for the same thing. I pray for Krishna to protect my children, keep them happy, healthy, and safe, and to allow me to continue to provide for them. I also ask Krishna to do with me what he pleases and to guide me along the path to Krishna consciousness. Am I being greedy for asking for these things? I've never been on, I've never been on to pray. I've never been on to pray. Oh, I'm sorry. I've never been one to pray. I've never been one to pray, and I had been an atheist or agnostic for the majority of my life. Thank you. First of all, I think that's amazing that he's been a, you've been an agnostic and an atheist for most Back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. And somehow you landed here where, you know, God's a blue cowherd boy with a flute. It's a pretty interesting <laughs> jump. <laughs> but at that point, just, well, why not? <laughs> it's a great question because I grew up praying for stuff, for health, for, uh, uh, for toys, for girlfriends. That's just... I thought God was like an order supplier, like an Amazon Prime. And um, the more you get into bhakti, you realize like, well, why am I praying for this person's health? Because maybe God wants to take this person. Ever, ever wonder that? Like, should I, should I pray for them to be preserved longer? What if God, why do I think I have the better plan than God? And if life is eternal, they're not dying anyway. Who's in pain? 
for my loved one dying, just me perhaps. Maybe they're supposed to leave right now because there's exponentially better things waiting for them. So my prayer as of lately is thy will be done. Your will, Krishna, you know better than me. I will miss this person. Please give this person strength and hope. I don't know what I will do, but what I pray for more than anything is connection for these children, connection for my spouse, connection for myself, connection for the people that are suffering, connection for that so-called enemy. That's the best prayer I can give somebody. Who cares if my family members live a very long time, but they're all monsters. You know, they all have horrible behavior, horrible character. Uh, they're all in prison for criminal activities, but they're living a long time in prison. How about if they get some type of spiritual connection? So, yeah, there is always fear. But what we break things down, right? We understand that the material body is not even us. And we witness it when it's close to us. It's like, ah, chronic sickness, disease, death, old age. And we're like shocked and we're bitter or we're angry or confused and we feel loss. But this is, when we study the Bhagavatam, it's business as usual. This is what Radha Swami said to me on the phone the other day. He said, the entire Bhagavatam is stories of destitution. And it's not just a destitution like puny old me. It's the haves. You know who the haves are? They're the people who are thinking, you guys have everything. Oh, if I, was just, if I just had what you had, then everything would be great. But I don't. So I'm going to scramble. I'm going to hustle. I'm going to work. Then I'll have. But here is the Bhagavatam. You have, right? Maharaj Prickett. He's the emperor. In the animal world, you have Gajendra. He's the head of, he's the king of all the elephants, right? You have a Yudhisthira who goes through great suffering. You have the Dura who's born in the royal house. You have King Maharaj Chitraketu. You have king after king after hero after, and they're all, you have Draupadi, right? The princess, the queen. Everybody's going through a hard time. Not just you. And some of you are like, well, I'm not going through a hard time. Give it a week. Give it a month. <laughs> Give it a year. Give it a decade. There are seasons of life where things are just going great. Anybody in a good season right now? One guy. <laughs> Everybody else is like, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, you just give it a chance. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Anybody going through a little pain right now? Raise your hand if you're a little pain. All right. Little pain. Little pain. Little pain, people. It's going to turn around. Seasons are going to change. It's cold winter. Guess what? Spring's around the corner. And if it's autumn in your life right now, the beautiful leaves changing. Crisp air. Go for a hike. Guess what? Zero degrees, 10 below, cold winds are coming. And that's just the way life turns. And the idea of samadhi is a sam, a same, a sameness between the happiness and distress. I'm not going to change winter, it's coming. And spring's also coming. How can I be somewhere in between in all of this? I don't even know how I got talking so about So what should that. he pray for? <laughs> what, should so what should we pray for? Uh, my idea is we pray for connection. Pray that these children, pray that our family, and pray that I become connected and not so dependent on the highs and lows of the material world because to the degree that I'm dependent on them, to the degree that I'm going to suffer and joy as they change. It's Jagannath Rathiyatra. If it rains, I'm still going to serve Lord Jagannath. The Jagannath Radha Yatra, if it's a sunny day, I'm still going to serve Lord Jagannath. That's our, that's our mood. It's okay. It's great to have the person here to say, that was okay, but not great. <laughs> or, that was, <laughs> usually it's like, oh, and that's my great answer. Maybe I could add a little something to it. For real, please. Um, is that also, you know, you, you're mentioning your family here and the, you know, uh, praying can, that I can protect them, that I can provide for them. And it's not unnatural or it's not against the principles of bhakti to pray like that. 
when we're seeing that role as service to God. If we disconnect that role from service to God, then then that prayer is, I mean, in one sense, the prayer is to God, but it's not like pure bhakti. But the idea is if you see your, because even we just read in Bhagavatam just a few chapters back, right, Brahma had a task to perform, which was the creation. He was doing this, That's that, that was his role to play. And he prayed to Lord Vishnu to empower him to do it. And he also prayed that in doing, carrying out that, that he wouldn't forget him or wouldn't become proud or wouldn't become disconnected in some way from God in doing that service. So if we see, like, for instance, protecting or providing for our family, if we see our family as related to God and we see our role in protecting and providing for them as a service to God on behalf of God, then even that prayer like, may I be able to serve you by protecting them, may I be able to serve you by providing for them, then it, it all gets tied in. And that's kind of how bhakti works as we're living in this world, is that it's not that we renounce the family, it's not that we renounce wealth, it's not that we renounce anything necessarily in particular, but we begin to see them as connected to God. And when we see them or everything as connected to God, even, you know, this is a building, this bhakti center, it's a material building, it's made out of material elements, it was bought and, you know, it, it created just like all the other buildings. But the people that are here serving here, they see this as this isn't our building. But ultimately, this building is an offering to God. And so all of the same kind of things that people have to do to maintain a building, every other building in New York City, they have to do. You know, they have to keep it clean. They got to follow all of the different um, kind of inspections and cover all that kind of stuff. But in doing that, because they're seeing it all related to God, then that all becomes devotional service. And so these prayers, if they're, if they're done with that vision or with that um, understanding, then all that ties in. And, and at the same time, what Raghunath is saying is so important, but ultimately you say, but, but you have your plan. So if this is how you want me to serve, then please empower me to do so. And, and at the same time, I'm, I accept whatever your plan will be. You got the sneezies, Kostuba. It's a little chilly this morning. No, it wasn't that. It was in that hospital, and they used so much AC. Oh, you were coddled, you see? Uh -huh. Coddled in there. I coddled myself. I'm not, no. Yeah. Well, not you. You didn't turn on the AC, right? They tried to coddle me, but they... Yeah. You, you know what I'm talking about? Summertime, they're like, let's make it freezing in this building. So you got to wear a sweater in the summertime. That is my pet peeve, is actually the it's AC. my pet peeve. Because yeah. it's like everybody's using them. If everyone would just turn them off, it'd be so much quieter. And just use fans. And it just use fans. Right? Just deal with it. Yeah. We, I think it, cre it just creates more intolerance. All right. Right? It's that coddling. It's that coddling. It's made you sick, you see? Sick of coddling. <laughs> okay, this is from Andreas from Cologne, All right, Germany. Germany. Yeah. Never been to Cologne? I have once. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have the feeling that Prabhupada's teachings, the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Bhagavad Gita, are like the complete zoomed out picture and all the issues I have to deal with on a daily basis. It fits right into this picture like pieces of a puzzle. I agree, right? I, I agree too. Like I need not go much anywhere else. In this way, the Srimad Bhagavatam conveyed to me via your explanations has often helped me out of topics in context so that I could understand them better. LGBTQ is a huge topic in Germany, and I guess in many other countries as well. I'm just starting to learn about it, and I find it confusing at times. Therefore, I would like to view it through the Vishnu goggles hmm. of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Could you please apply the eternal Vedic teachings to the manifold questions related to homosexuality, transgender, gender, and sex, and, and equal rights? Okay, this is a two-part question because there's a similar question. Okay, the from... similar is Chris, Kristen Ramos. Is she here? Kristen Ramos? Okay. June is LG. This is a, sort of another question. Ready? June is LGBTQ plus pride month. We often say that we are not the physical body, but a spirit soul. Also, that there is unity in diversity, regardless of religion, faith, as long as we have developed our love of God. I'd love to hear the moral principles and views in perspective of bhakti, 
when it comes to diverse sexual and gender identity. Coming and learning from a religious background, this has always been conflicting. Religious beliefs and morality, etc. Great question. Time it is question. a great question. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting how she ended that. It's just like, this is, she's, what did she say? This has always been conflicting, religious beliefs and morality. <laughs> and sometimes it's like that, right? It's like you think like the religious beliefs are supposed to provide the morality, right? right. But sometimes, you you know, what you see coming out of religion, it, it makes you ask, is that really moral? And so what is morality? Like from a religious perspective, morality, and morality means like what is right and what is wrong, you know, or what is good and what is bad. So how do we understand morality coming from a religious or spiritual tradition? My understanding of that is morality is what pleases God, right? If it pleases God, it's moral. If it doesn't please God, it's immoral. And so then the question would be, well, then what pleases God? And, and, and um, Kristen is asking specifically, I'll, I'll deal with the Kristen's question first. She's asking, how does morality relate to questions of sec, you know, sexual, uh, diverse sexual and gender identity issues? Well, my understanding is there's a morality that goes across the board. And if we look to, like, there's so many places that we can look. But like, for instance, if you look to these verses that we like to go to a lot, the, the, the last verses of the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, beginning from text 13 on, you get, Krishna says again and again and again, this is what pleases me, right? This person is very dear to me, he says, the person that's like this. So I'll just read a bit from that. I've done it many times, but it's the kind of thing that just um, requires so much repetition and meditation. These are verses I never memorized, but I really should, you know? What are they, 13, what through what? 13 through 20 of the 12th chapter. Let's get Nityananda Chandra on that with our Nityananda verse Chandra, learning that's group. A good we have idea. a verse learning group if you're inter interested in yeah. learning Bhagavad Gita shlokas. When is it, Mara? Uh, Wednesday, Wednesday evenings and Saturday. Okay, let's start. Email Mara, wisdom of the sages 108 at gmail.com. This is so great. We've got so many good things. So like, right? We've got the Bhakti going. Recovery we group. Groups. We've got Bhakti Recovery at 9.30 this morning. And then we got another subgroup with the the uh, shloka chanting and uh, we'll sweet baby krishna more. subgroup sweet baby krishna is there and more to come okay so here here's let's just read and we won't even read them all but just think about this and think about this you said you, you read this verse and it sounds like oh well, that's a sweet verse but this is actually morality like if we want to understand what morality is so krishna says one who is not envious and again i believe my my belief is that when Srila Prabhupada translates envious Especially what he means is like, it means like, um, it's kind of more like an old English um, uh, uh, way that he's using that word, but more precisely, is, it's really about like animosity, right? Like sometimes- th I that, thought it meant that, you want what the other person has. That's the way we use it today, but, but I'm saying like, if you go back, animosity, it's, it's more like animosity or hatred. Okay. So one who is not, who has no animosity, but is a kind friend to all living entities, right? That this is morality, right? Mm. Who does not think themselves the proprietor, who is free from false ego, who is equal in both happiness and distress, who is tolerant, always satisfied, self-controlled, and engaged in devotional service with determination, with mind and intelligence fixed on me. Such a devotee of mine is very dear. So he begins there, the very first place he starts, someone who has no animosity towards others and is a kind friend, and he says it specifically, the, the, the word that he uses is sarva bhutanam. Bhutanam means living entities or, you know, every living being. Bhutanam means living beings and sarva means all living beings, mm. right? So right there, there's like an unequivocal statement that if you want to be moral, that you should be, um, have no animosity towards any living being and, and actually be a kind friend to every living being. Right. And then if you just go to the, to the next verse, I believe, let me pull that out. He who, he by whom no one is put into difficulty, right, and is not disturbed by anyone, who is equipoise in happiness and distress, uh, fear and anxiety is very dear to me. So if, if, if That's saying a being a, a friend to everyone wasn't enough, let's take this a little bit deeper. Let's go to another level and, and say, you're actually supposed to move through this world without putting anyone into difficulty, right? That's morality. 
How about without being disturbed by it? And then that's the next part, right? Like without being no disturbed. one can disturb me unless I allow them to disturb me. Yeah. And so what I see these verses, and it's throughout the Gita, if you want to boil down morality, and it's not, and it's not just morality for morality's sake, like morality simply for the idea of pleasing a, like a God who, who could be like whimsical or something like that. But behind this morality, if you boil this all down, you have two things, essentially. Kindness and simplicity, mm. right? Being kind to everyone. And simplicity is what makes one able to be equipoise in, in all different circumstances. It's what enables one not to be disturbed by others. When I'm simple, I don't have a lot of demands, right? Because my happiness is coming from within. So morality is kindness and simplicity. And so that goes across the board. So in one sense, we don't even have to ask, well, how does that relate to issues of you know, gender questions and so on. It applies there as it applies everywhere. You know, how do I relate to someone, you know, who may be gay or maybe, you know, you relate with kindness. You know, that, that's always there. If you're, if you're relating without kindness, then you, we can understand that that behavior is immoral. So that's how I understand it. You know, it's in a very general way. And in one sense, I have a general way of looking at the previous question too that was coming from Andreas from Cologne who's saying, well, how do we understand like homosexuality itself with the Vishnu goggles, like through the teachings of the Bhagavatam? And so again, I look at it just like in, in just a, a very practical way. Like in other words, the Bhagavatam is going to explain to us that we're not these bodies, that we're a spark of spiritual energy that is in this body temporarily and that is moving through different bodies. And it's not only that we're moving through different bodies, but we're, we're moving through those different bodies. And we spoke about this uh, with Matthew's question, yeah, last week. But when you, when you transmigrate from one body to the next, you transmigrate along with the mind. So the soul and the mind transmi transmigrate from one body to the next. Now the body is the body, and the bodies come in, in male and female. And the mind also comes with you and that mind is programmed with desires and how we understand one's like say gender preference has to do with the desires that are in the mind right and that mind is also material so it's changing you know it, it, it's programmed this way once and, it, and then as we take on the next body it also changes again so just like like say I were to migrate into my next body and I would became a dog which is a possibility no, it, <laughs> it could happen. Unless it was a very, very sweet well, spiritual dog. Well, even like we dog. saw, we saw Maharaj Bharta, who became like so advanced in, in, in his spiritual practice. Right? This he is became a deer. This will come up in the fourth canto box. A fascinating story. That's he was the great king. Even India is to this day is named after him, Bharta. And he he you know he had incredible opulence and power, but he had zero attraction for it. He was just waiting for the day that he could you know, um, enthrone an, a qualified person and move out into the forest to just get deeply absorbed in his spiritual life. When that moment came, he did it. But somehow, you know, because he was all alone and because he didn't have any association, and he, he saw one very vulnerable, cute, adorable little deer, and he became attached to that deer, and he just became too attached, you know. And so he was on a very exalted level of, of spiritual, but that kind of like just got him a little bit, it, it kind of like took him away from his focus. And uh, in his next life, he became a deer. Yeah, it right. wasn't a bad thing to take care of a orphaned fawn. It's a good thing. Yeah. But, but he forgot God. He forgot God. And and he that, forgot how that, that deer relates to God. Good thing. Yeah. He forgot the greatest thing. Yeah. And therefore he left his body meditating on the little snuggling deer. How will it get along without me? I know. What will you do? I, you need me. <laughs> yeah. You need me for... And I think that's probably every person who's going through maybe a loss of their life. There's people out there. How will they exist without me? Yeah, that's there. And they, somehow they do. And they do. Yeah. Isn't it hard, horrible to even think that? We're like, all going to die and the world's going to go on without us. Yeah, the whole <laughs> world's going to go on and they're going to be like, oh, rock it up. Yeah, who's nice. Anyway, back to work. Exactly. That's what uh, happened. Oh, my God. How shocking. Okay. Anyway, back to Instagram. <laughs> That's exactly what happens. So, um, so in any case, I could take a birth as a dog, my next birth. And if I did, what would happen is my mind would go with me, but there would be a reprogramming in that mind that would be appropriate for that do dog's body. 
so that I would have desires like a dog's desires. You know, there would be a shift there. But, ex you know, but even there's always exceptions and there's always nuances and there's always, you know, so like even with Bharta, he took birth as a deer. But what happened, Raghunath? When you're not reading the chat board. I'm not reading the chat board. I'm looking at Matt Goddard. <laughs> okay. what With great attention him, and interest. On that deer. He took birth as a deer, but it wasn't yeah. an ordinary deer. It was a deer that could remember his previous birth. Okay, so that's my point. It, he went with the mind, and the mind was a... He went actually almost with like a human mind in the body of the deer, which is a very unusual kind of situation and and you know what it also sa it sets up for these things for people who like mistreat animals you never know who that animal is it could be a it well it could be a sacred being i mean it is it a sacred be, being meaning it could be a, a great sage who's about to go back to godhead back to go, about to be liberated but they're in this body for one more birth mm. they have to do time one more time in a body and you came Burn along some karma in, you know, and you kicked, you stepped on that bug, yeah. <laughs> swatted that fly. All right. 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 So my point here being is that even this is an example of where an unusual thing happened, a, a nuanced thing happened where he was in the body of a deer, but still had the mind of a human. Right. And how do we understand that mind? Because it had the desires of a human and the thinking of a human and the emotions of a human. So what is homosexuality? It's, it's one form of a, like it's a, it's a, it's a body of one gender and a mind of another. And so it's not uncommon when you hear a homosexual person speak, like they may use a phrase like, I feel like I am a woman trapped in a man's body. Right? So what does that mean? Is that the mind has those feminine attributes and feminine desires, but it's in a body that's male mm. or vice versa like that. So if we're saying, how do we look at homosexuality through the goggles of Bhagavatam? The idea is that desires exist in the mind and they're temporary and, they're cha and they change and they get reprogrammed, and especially they get reprogrammed when we enter into a new body. Now, if you say this, technically what it means, and I want to be careful when I say this, I, I want to be clear. Technically what it means is the mind can be changed and can be reshaped and reformatted. So someone may say, then, well, then a homosexual, a homosexual person could reformat their mind, right? And, 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 and so you get these, not that they're yogic ideas, but... You have people that say, you know, what, like these kind of Christian groups that try to like, what, what's the term when you try to like conversion therapy? Conversion therapy conversion thank you. Therapy. That, so like is conversion therapy possible? You know, technically it is, but like it's so far gone. It's like it would be so rare that a person be able to do that, that it's not even worth getting into, you know. But then when you go into the next body, there's a shift generally with that mind. And most commonly... You know, the female body has a mind that's programmed feminine, and the male body has a mind that's programmed male. But there are all kind of nuances there, and, and there, you know, and, and and therefore we get all different kind of nuanced gender ideas. Um, so that's how we understand it through Bhagavatam. You know, that there's a combination of body and mind, and and they're all different kind of, uh, you know, there, there's there's more common ones, and then there's sometimes nuanced ones. And then how do we look at it morally? Morally, we look at it as that again we're kind to every living being that we meet you know there's no room for hatred there's no room for cruelty and that's morality according to Bhagavatam yeah, that's Thank beautiful I, 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 our attraction to anything of this material world be it same sex opposite sex <clears throat> is not the real attraction of the soul anyway so it's good just to zoom out and look at the biggest picture some people will say oh this is people who are uh, uh, homophobic, they have this hatred towards. This is completely perverse. How could they do this? The whole attraction to the material world is perverse. The whole attraction to the material world is based in an illusion that there's something out there that's going to satisfy us, whether we're straight or whether we're gay, or however our mind is programmed, we have to get it back to the original programming, which mm -hmm. is I have to realize that the real thing that's going to fulfill my heart is not a being of this world or some type of pleasure, some amusement park of this world, but it's a deep connection to spirit, no matter what body or mind I'm born into. And truthfully, I don't even, I don't even say, you know, I don't even like the idea of I'm identifying with this body as me. And we try to find our equality and our stability in our group. 
that has the same sex or has different sex or has a skin color or has a different skin color. And to the degree that we keep it on a bodily identification, you will suffer and you will create an other. If we really want to find connection with each other, let's pull it back to what we actually have in common. We live in a world where people are concentrating on the differences and we're going to try to find peace there. Good luck. What do we have in common? And when you really boil it down, this is the, this is the essential teaching of the Gita. We have one thing in common and it extends beyond gender preferences. It extends beyond our gender period. It extends beyond the human species. It extends beyond, right? Any, any, be, any being, we're spirit souls. And therefore, I'm gonna treat all spirit souls with dignity. You know why? Because they suffer, like I suffer. And I don't wanna suffer. And I don't wanna make them suffer. We were talking yesterday about like, I don't even like sticking that hook in the worm, mm -hmm. right? Who wants to see that worm struggle? And we start to change the way we think about beings. I like that. Did you mind that I added on to your answer? <laughs> no, we've been doing that today. That's good. Okay. We're doing that today. <laughs> right. That's what we're doing. You ready? It's my turn. I got a question for you, and this is coming song. from our friend my who we were just turn. talking about. Nityananda Chandra from Dallas, Texas. Okay. We get a lot of questions from Texas. You ready? Yeah. It says, Hare Krishna, my friends. That? We have heard the statement, live it to give it. I think we've heard that from you, Raghunath, right? I say, learn it, live it, give it. Learn it, live it, give it. Okay, well, at least live it, give it is within learn it, live it, give yeah. it. And he says, and it makes sense. But you have also mentioned people that seemed marked to give, even if they were unable to live it to a high degree. Thank you both always. You understand? Yeah. What is that? So how do you? If, how are people capable of giving it if they're not living it? You said there are people in your life that had given it to you, but they weren't living it. Does that work? Generally, people who can give it but don't live it have lived it in mm -hmm. some previous life. On some level. On some it. level. But due to bad association, they, they struggle now. So, so they have this ability to give. I mean, there's authors I've read from who they themselves are troubled. That's just going to happen. You're going to be able to learn from people that maybe aren't living from the highest standard. But you should understand that those people have been tagged by God for your benefit. Now, if you're one of those persons that are like, I'm a good giver, but I just can't live it, I would encourage you to add more to your life. Add more spirit to your life. Add more disciplines to your life. Because if you feel like you are a giver, and a lot of people listening are, to the degree that you refine your life, you'll be able to give exponentially more. Because your realization will get deeper and deeper and deeper. I can't talk to you about the benefits of jogging if I don't jog. I can talk about it. I might inspire you a little bit. But if I jog on a regular basis, then I can really talk about the highs and lows of it, etc. So if you want to get something even more, you got to give it, you got to live it, right? If I want to set the example for eating healthy for my children, I got to eat healthy. If I want to tell my kids, hey, don't yell. I can't yell at them to stop yelling. Make sense? <laughs> That makes sense. I'm gonna end it there. All right. Why don't we end it there? Huh? Why don't we end it there? We had. Is it time? It's pretty much time. Takeaways, Mara. <laughs> I shouldn't oh. do that, honey. <laughs> hey, here's one. Mara hit a deer on the way down here. Oh. What should she do for repentance? She has to go find a deer, take it into your home, and care for it for its entire nurse life. That deer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for joining us on this sacred Rathiatra day. Thanks for all the Zoomers. <laughs> oh, listen to that noise. They're going crazy here at the Bhakti Center. Oh, they're stage diving. Oh, this is insane. What's going on here? Thanks everybody for joining us. If you'd like to support what we're doing, patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. We really appreciate it. We're excited to sing and dance today. Woo! In front of Lord Jagannath, Lord of the Universe.
This is, we're not trying to teach a religion here. We're trying to teach the truth that ties all this religion together. Who cares about joining a, just another bizarre sect? There's millions of sects out there. Let's find some truth. Let's find some commonality that we can all hold on to and find some connection with each other. Each other. And I think one of the best ways to do it is through singing and dancing. So now I will dance. Yes, it's the